Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the MIDAS seminar series. My name is Yang Chen, Assistant Professor of Statistics and MIDAS. And today, we're very happy to have Professor David Downson from Duke University to give us a very interesting talk on representing higher dimensional data with lower dimensional uh, structure. Um, so let's welcome Professor Downson. If you have any questions, please raise your hands, and I'll pass the mic to you. Okay, so Didong Lee, who's on the uh, faculty market, and uh, Minerva Mukhopadhyay, who's a former postdoc, who na is now on the faculty in I India. Um, I'll, I'll start out with a, a bit of background motivation. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about uh, what's called manifold learning, which is a type of uh, approach for nonlinear dimension reduction. Um, and throughout the talk, there'll be a common theme of using kind of a simple dictionary for, for nonlinear dimension reduction, which is based on spheres. Okay, and then spheres have a nice, nice motivation that I'll give throughout. And through the first part, we'll be talking about using spheres in the manifold learning context. And we propose this new thing we call spherical principal components analysis, which you can take PCA, and this gives you a very, very simple alternative to PCA, which has a simple analytic solution, no iterative algorithm or anything like that. But it, it allows curvature, and so it can do really massively better than PCA um, in a lot of contexts. And so you could take any algorithm that uses PCA, use this SPCA instead, and often get really much better performance. Um, and we'll illustrate that a little bit. Um, I'll then, then switch gears from, from manifold learning type nonlinear unsupervised dimension reduction uh, to density estimation, also inspired by this, uh, some of the results in this, this part and by spheres, we'll propose a new type of of kernel for kernel density estimation um, that we call the Fisher-Gaussian kernel, which, which will have some, some, some curvature in it. Is there any chalk? Um, yeah, that has some curvature in it, and so then it can characterize um, things better than using Gaussian kernels. And then I'll have two, two brief vignettes at the end, one on, on classification and, and one on, on, on new type of di distance estimation. So I'm, so I'm an applied statistician. I'm quite applied. I have sort of a biostats background. And so I, I work with a lot of collaborators um, recently in ecology, a lot of neuroscience and epidemiology. And um, we're often, of course, collecting high dimensional data. And so one of, my, um, one of my motivations is to develop new tools that we can use for making sense of these data. So, so not like industry applications so much, but we'd like to do scientific inferences based on complicated high dimensional data and learn something interpretable about the data. And so we, we just got this new grant from the ERC on um, where we have occurrences of many different species at different spatial locations across the globe. And we'll have you know, maybe millions of different species. And so we need some models for that. Um, in neuro neuroscience, we, we would like the ways to make sense of millions of white matter tracts in the brain, the human brain connectome. Um, in, in epidemiology, we're working on what you could call like exposomics, which are, we're relating exposures to human health outcomes, okay? Um, and so data in all of these applications are really high dimensional and complicated, and so we need, we need better tools, I mean, maybe fundamentally better tools than we currently have for making sense of the data. Um, unlike in a lot of tech applications, the data have limited sample size. I, I don't really want to take a model that has a zillion parameters, like a deep neural network, and throw it at the problems, um, because it'll, it'll have a lot of problems with limited sample size and, and in terms of interpretability and re reproducibility, generalizability. So we don't want a black box. So we need, we need something interpretable for learning low dimensional structure, okay? And I'd like to do sort of standard statistical things as well. Um, with uncertainty quantification. So um, 
I'm not going to actually address any of these problems really today, but I'd like to sort of take a step in the right direction, I would say. And so how do we think about dimension reduction? So we, we have some complicated high dimensional data. We'd like to do some sort of dimension reduction. And this is really a toy mathematical model that I'll use a, a lot throughout the talk is that maybe the original data are like 100 dimensional say real vectors, but they have some lower dimensional intrinsic structure that we don't know about that, that might be nonlinear. And so one example would be something like this Swiss roll. You might have noisy data around something like this nonlinear manifold, but you don't know that that's there at all because the data are like 100 dimensional and we can't just like plot it and see the structure in the data, okay? And so we, we would like to figure out this lower dimensional nonlinear structure in the data adaptively somehow and then use that in our statistical procedures. Okay, and so I'll, I'll, today I'll su suppose that the data are just real vectors. Um, we can deal with more complicated data, but I won't talk about it. And so, you know, one simple model that I'd like to be able to deal with would be something like this. I might say that all oh, my measured data are these xi's, and so that's like 100 dimensional or something, and then maybe it's nonlinearly related to some lower dimensional coordinates or factors, a to i. And then I might have a little bit of measurement error. So maybe xi is 100 dimensional and a to i is little d dimensional. Little d might be 3 or 5 or something like that. And so that would give me a lot of, of, of dimension reduction. And I could think of these guys as some type of nonlinear principal components or something like that. Okay? So that would be like a type of model I might think of if I was taking a model-based approach to this problem. Um, if, if the F was linear, then we might think of something like just uh, factor analysis or principal components analysis, and there's you know, more than thousands of papers on that sort of thing. And that would be totally reasonable if F was linear. But what, 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 if, what if the data are really nonlinear, the relationships in our data are nonlinear, as they probably almost always are, what, what do we do? Um, you know, one, one approach that people use a lot is they would use some type of local linear approximation. I might do something like clustering the data in local neighborhoods and then apply PCA in each local neighborhood. And so there's, you know, literally thousands of different or tens of thousands of different machine learning and fly papers uh, doing that sort of thing. Um, approach two would be maybe a more model-based approach. We might use something like a nonlinear factor model. We might say, oh, the, the A to I's, the factors are just Gaussian to set the scale for them. And then we might model F using a Gaussian process or a deep neural network or something like that, some sort of black box nonlinear function. Um, and so that, that second approach would, would include a lot of methods that are quite popular like Gaussian process latent variable models, um, something that's been cited I think something like 8,000 times in 10 years or a little more than 10 years of variational autoencoders, which people use all the time. They would take F to be a, a deep neural network and they would use a variational approximation to this problem, okay? And then you could do something like, I start out with some complicated images, I, I train this variational autoencoder and now I can simulate random Gaussians, apply this complicated nonlinear function and then create images that look like my training images, okay? So that's, that's the kind of game with this variational autoencoder. So, um, so one of the, the, I played a lot with these GPLVMs and, and VAE approaches and, and from a kind of scientific perspective, they're still at what I'd call the uh, flaky mess stage. <laughs> and so you apply them and you apply them to the, to the data from a given starting point, you apply it once and then maybe I, I change the starting point and I apply it again, I might get quite different nonlinear dimension reduction. So. Um, because the model is, is it, it, A, the objective function is, is very, 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 very non-convex. It has many, 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 many local optima and saddle points. And the model is hideously under-identified. And so you run into really big problems in applying these types of methods. Uh, they're certainly not very, very interpretable and, and very robust and reproducible. Uh, we're working on that separately, but I won't talk about it today. Um, as a simpler model, we might think of doing something like manifold learning. And so, as I mentioned, that might, that might be a useful kind of toy mathematical model of lower dimensional structure. And so what that means is essentially that we might have some lower dimensional manifold. What's a manifold? I mean, it's like a Riemannian manifold, meaning that if I kind of go into a, a point on that surface and I take a little uh, approximation of the surface in a small neighborhood, it's going to be flat and Euclidean. But then as I go farther, it's going to be very non-Euclidean. Non okay? Um, 
Yeah, so this is called a Swiss roll. It has dimension D equals two in a higher dimensional space. So what manifold learning tends to do is it tends to try to take the original data, say 100 dimensional, and apply some algorithm so that I can replace the original data, XIs, with some lower dimensional eta i's. And so I take my 100 dimensional thing and I replace it with a three dimensional thing, um, the eta i's. And I do that in a way that maintains distances. And so if XI and XJ are close together, then I apply this mapping, and if there is an intrinsic lower dimensional structure, then eta i should be close to eta j, okay, it's the game in manifold learning. Um, what the algorithms don't do in general is actually learn any manifold or, 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 or figure anything out other than this mapping. Every time you would do it, you would in general have to, uh, if I get new data, I have to put all the data together and I have to re-implement the algorithm. I can't do cross-validation, I can't take new data points and then automatically give me ADAs for new data points. Um, I don't have anything interpretable. It's just giving you a black box for nonlinear non dimension reduction. Might be useful in some setting. I have some original high dimensional data. I would like to visualize it maybe, or I, I might want to reduce it in dimension so that I can then relate it to some Ys in a manageable way. This could be quite useful, but it's not, it's not very interpretable. Um, and it has a lot of uh, uh, problems in general, most manifold learning algorithms. So, so real manifold learning algorithms would require some type of uh, dictionary to approximate or learn, or learn the manifold structure, the lower dimensional structure in your data. Um, and so what a dictionary is, it would just be made up of some sort of simple mathematical pieces, ideally simple um, pieces that you use in approximating that manifold, which I'll call, call M here. Um, in the literature, almost always these pieces are chosen to be linear, okay? So if I have the Swiss roll, I'm taking like little, little planes and I'm, 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 I'm approximating that, that Swiss roll locally with a bunch of little planes, okay? Almost always. So simple, these linear pieces are really nice computationally and they're appealing um, conceptually as well, they're quite useful, I think. Um, but, but you often need like a lot of pieces. So you can see even if we just have a circle, which is like a really simple one dimensional thing, I need a lot of little linear pieces to approximate that circle very accurately. And um, you know, one example of a manifold would be like the surface of my body or something. If you think of a Pixar movie or a video game, often they'll approximate the surface of a person by Delaunay triangulization. So you put a bunch of triangles and then you put it, do a surface rendering doing that. You can imagine that if you have something complicated like the surface of my body, you need a, a, a ton of triangles, like a huge number. And now if I'm thinking about noisy data that I'm trying to like learn that manifold structure, that's not going to be very good statistically or computationally if I need you know, 10,000 or 5,000 little um, linear pieces to approximate that, uh, that unknown um, nonlinear structure in the data. That's going to be really bad. Okay, so, um, so we're going to have problems with these local linear uh, pieces, and so the first thing we thought about, okay, well, we can go from first order to, to second order. We could uh, replace um, local linearity with some sort of uh, local quadratic form or some such thing. Um, but if we do that, we're substituting one problem for another. We're take each piece, we want to have few pieces and few parameters overall, and so we, if we're approximating the structure with fewer pieces with the quadratic forms, then we, we have also, we have way more parameters per piece. And so uh, linear um, approximation will have order P parameters per piece. If we go quad quadratic, that's gonna have order P squared parameters per piece. So that's a lot more parameters. And so we'll, we, might, we might not win that, that game. We might have more parameters overall using quadratic approximations. There's also another, a number of other very pr practical problems that you run into in developing algorithms that actually are feasible, um, don't involve really badly non-convex cases, and aren't just a, like a disaster using quadratic approximations. And so we, we've shelved that for now. Um, and so what, we, what we've um, decided on instead is we, we're focusing on the spheres idea. And you can illustrate it in this simple case. And so this is like a one-dimensional manifold. Um, like embedded on the, the surface of the screen. And you can think, okay, well, let, like, let's say I want to approximate in the neighborhood of this point P. If I use a local linear approximation, I can approximate it really well like in there, okay? If I use a circle, which is in differential geometry, it's called, this is called an osculating circle. 
then I can approximate it really well from there to there. And so if I start using planes, I would need one there, one there, one there, one there, one there. And, and then I just need one circle to approximate in a much broader region. Okay? And so that, that might be good, even though a circle is really simple, simple object or sphere. It's quite simple. So then we, 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 um, our, what we propose is spherelets, which is a, a dictionary for, for subspaces okay? that might be useful broadly in very many different contexts. So pieces of spheres or spherelets. And um, we have theory, very quite strong theory, saying that many fewer spheres are going to be required than planes to obtain this the same approximation error. Okay. Um, each sphere is really simple. It's a few parameters. You can easily do things like I, if I have an arbitrary point, I can easily calculate analytically the projection of that point to the sphere. That's really important in fitting these things. I can also calculate, if I have two points on the sphere, I can calculate the minimal distance between those two points on the sphere, which is known as the geodesic distance. That's also super important. And so we can calculate those things. If I use an ellipse or a quadratic, I can't calculate those things in closed form. I'd have to have some sort of complicated iterative algorithm. So a, a sphere is really quite nice. Um, and so let, let's just kind of flash up the uh, math theory um, showing their approximation performance. Okay. So just briefly. So let's say that, that our manifold is a compact C3 D-dimensional orientable manifold. That means we, we can uh, define a, what's known as a volume form on the manifold. And we embed that in P-dimensional space. Okay. Um, we can extend our result to a collection of such manifolds because really in reality the nonlinear structure in your data might not be one curved thing. It might be one over he one here and then one over here. There could be discontinu discontinuity between those. Um, so we want to bound the number of pieces needed to obtain a given approximation error. So I have, let's say that I actually know the manifold and now I want to, I have like God comes in and perfectly puts the pieces in. How many pieces do I need to get within epsilon approximation error of that manifold. Okay. That's the game. So we want some sort of covering number. So NH epsilon M is the minimal number of planes that we would need to get within epsilon error of manifold M. Um, NS epsilon M is the minimal number of spheres we, we need. And, and our conjecture is that there's going to be a lot fewer spheres for many manifolds. And the, 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 it ends up being pretty simple, actually, and, and neat, the theory. And so we have a couple of constants that, that matter a lot. Um, K is the maximum curvature. So your manifold might be really curved, really far from linear. And so then hyperplanes aren't going to do very well. If you have a high maximum curvature, probably they're not going to do very well. Spheres don't mind a high maximum curvature. Another thing that matters is the maximum rate of change in curvature. So if I'm sitting on a hill, my surface, and if I, if I go in different, if I'm going in, I'm on the top of the hill and I walk in different directions, how steep does it fall off in different directions? If that varies a ton, and I'm trying to approximate it accurately on the top of the hill, then my sphere might not be that great because it has the same curvature everywhere. Okay, and so that's a, that's a worry with spheres. Um, so we get this tight bounds on covering number and we have a handle on the constants even. Okay, so this is the bound on the um, the number of hyperplanes needed is like C V epsilon minus D, D over two. Okay, so um, V, remember V is the volume of the manifold. Um, epsilon is the approximation error, D is the dimension, okay? Um, if, we, if we then use, um, we're then gonna use spheres, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the manifold and we're gonna break it up into happy regions and unhappy regions. And the unhappy, in the happy regions, that's the F epsilon subset, um, those are all points in the manifold that have less than some upper bound in the change in a principal curvature at that location, okay? So you don't have, um, and so F epsilon will be putting points along uh, on the manifold that don't have too big change in, in curvature. And then we take some covering closure of that with respect to some balls that have some radius, and then we call that V epsilon. So that's the good part of the, um, of the manifold. Those are all points in the manifold that are close to these um, uh, places that don't have a big change in directional curvature, principal curvature. Okay, and then, then our upper bound on, on the spheres is like this. And so it's exactly the same as above. These are the same constants, amazingly. And, um, but we get, we get this part, 
So if, 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 v minus, um, if v minus v epsilon was v, so the good part was zero volume, then we would just have the same um, upper bound as, as above. But as we get more good part, then we go from minus d over 2 to minus d over 3, which is a big gain, a very big gain. Okay? Um, so that's all like kind of just math covering number theory. So it suggests, I'll say that, but um, since epsilon equals 0, for the first thing is that, that it shows this curse of dimensionality in terms of the dimension of the subspace, not the dimension of the data we've originally collected, but the dimension of the lower dimensional structure in the data. Um, we can't have d be very large, or we're going to need a lot of data. Um, um, so we're going to need a lot of pieces uh, to, ch to, to approximate that surface, even without any statistical error, as d increases. So that's the curse of dimensionality. So our spherelets can decrease the curse if um, there aren't too many locations having big changes in principal curvature. And we found in, in applications that that tends to be the case. You have to cook up really strange cases where there's like a really big change in, in principal curvature at, at very many locations on the manifold would be very some, something that has these sharp edges to it or something, which is strange. Um, OK, so with that motivation, we want to kind of use this sphere idea and to develop some st stuff. And so the, the first thing we do is spherical principal components analysis, which gives us now a local approximation to the manifold uh, using, instead of PCA, spherical PCA. So we start out with some data matrix X, which is n by P. Um, um, you know, D, D is the, the dimension of our, our manifold, and we can choose that by cross-validation, for example. Um, so we're, now we're going to take, take from X, we're going to get Y, and Y is going to be the uh, pro projection to an affine plane that's D plus one dimensional. And so the, the D dimensional sphere is going to be embedded in a D plus one dimensional Euclidean space. And so we basically just do D plus one dimensional principal components analysis and then project those XIs to the, uh, d, the, the, the d plus one dimensional affine plane. Um, that's all just available in analytic form. And then from that, we project the, the points on that d plus one dimensional affine plane to the d dimensional sphere. And this is just the form uh, for the projection. OK, and then we just can calculate everything. So we can calculate just analytically the, the center of the sphere uh, is like this. The radius is like this, and so we have the center and the radius of the sphere, and we have the points on the sphere, um, so that we take the best um, approximating sphere, and we can get the fitted values on the sphere, all just um, trivially analytically. Okay, and so um, so this is our SPCA. We could just very trivially just instead of using PCA, use this um, in any application where you use PCA. And I won't talk about it today, but you can also get something, we haven't published on this yet, but you can get a notion of principal component scores as well that can give you some interpretability. Um, yeah, so, um, so yeah, so this is nice. Let's see how this does in practice. So we analyze data using spherelets. Um, our, our, our covering number theorem suggests we should see big gains in practical performance. Um, so the game we're going to play is we're going to take existing algorithms that use uh, PCA or some local linear approximation and then we're just going to substitute in spherical PCA and get a spherical version and see if we can then like do a lot better. Okay? Um, so we did that in like, you know, 50 different examples. I'll just show a random selection of them. Um, here's the Swiss roll example. And so most of these plots, what they are, it's log of the root mean square error, over, um, and then the x-axis is the log of the number of pieces, okay? And we could go out farther. It's going to beat it in general. Um, and so what are the different curves? Uh, are, 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 I have two curves for what's called geometric multi-resolution analysis, which is some multi, uh, this extension of wavelets to, um, to density estimation problems, uh, which is uh, what I view as a state of the art. It's a quite beautiful approach developed by a variety of people, including people at Johns Hopkins. Um, the red curve is local PCA, um, and the, the, the blue curve is, is spherelets, okay? So you can see that we have um, just much better, we get a better drop off in the number uh, as the, we add components, and we have better overall out of sample uh, root mean square error in estimating the Swiss roll. And the Swiss roll is not a good case for us at all. It's a terrible case for us, because think about the change in directional curvature. If I'm sitting on the Swiss roll, if I go this direction, the curvature is zero, 
But if I go this direction, the curvature is increasing a lot to, as I go towards the center. And so that's a big change in directional curvature, and we're still doing really well um, relative to local linear. Um, yeah, so here's the story. Um, so it also worked really well on spirals, Olympic rings, Swiss roll, um, various imaging examples that are uh, commonly used in the imaging literature, like a, tool, a, a, a cartoon armadillo or a cartoon dragon, uh, many different real data sets. It, it often, you get the blue curve is just dramatically lower. And this is on the log scale. Um, so I don't have time to go through all, all those examples, but they, they all show curves that look like this. We also wanted to look a little bit about um, Imaging, and so, so one thing people do in imaging using manifolds is to say, okay, well, I have an image that might be blurry, but if I use some manifold assumption, maybe I can de-denoise the, the image, okay? And so one state-of-the-art method for that is called manifold blurring mean shift. And in that, they use PCA in one of the pieces, and so we cheat and steal everything from them, but then we, 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 we use SPCA instead of PCA. And so here are some of the results. And so these are like um, handwritten images from drunk postal service workers or, um, in, in UPS, so which write terribly or something. And so um, the top is the, uh, is the actual image for zeros and threes. And we put all of the digits in. Um, the, the middle row is the, uh, is the result using a manifold blurring mean shift with PCA. And the bottom row is the result with uh, spherical PCA. Okay, so you can see by eye, that it does really a lot better. Okay. So that's, um, yeah, so that's the on spherelets. I, I wanted to cover some other things, and so I, I just gave a kind of brief, brief, brief show on spherelets. I think it provides a really useful alternative to PCA. And so if you're using PCA, particularly, it's say, in some machine learning algorithm, then, then it's easy to try out spherelets and see if it is improving your performance because it has a really simple analytic form. It's not like a highly parameterized thing. It's just adding a, a center and a radius to, to spherelets and so it, it, it does, uh, to PCA. And so that doesn't really increase the number of parameters very much, of course. Okay. So we also wanted to, like kind of motivated by this sphere success, we wanted to develop model-based approaches. I'm mo mostly known as a, as a Bayesian kind of modeler. And so, can we, can we use this um, idea and, and develop a model? Is that possible? And so, um, particularly without resorting to some sort of complicated black box, which is going to be terrible because we tried these things and they suck. Okay, so, so we were going to uh, uh, consider these, these toy examples. And so, let's say I wanted to do bivariate density estimation as a toy example, and, and, but th these are my data right here, okay? So I might try kernel density estimation, but these are my data, or these are my data, okay? Um, and so you can imagine if, if, if the current state of the art is terrible for that, how is it going to do in 100 dimensions where you have like some complicated nonlinear structure? So, um, so these are also toy, standard toy examples in, the, in this literature. So what if we have nonlinear structure? How do we model or estimate the density of the data? Um, of course, real-world data often have nonlinear relationships among the variables. They might not be like something like this, but they might be something else. So are current density estimation methods adequate in, in the presence of su such relationships? So we could try this nonlinear factor models. We could try frequentist kernel density estimation. We could try kernel mixture models using a variety of kernels. Um, approach one is like a black box. We're just not going to consider it here. Um, we, we have tried it a little bit and it doesn't do that well. It does better than some of these other approaches. But. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take that data. So the, the, these data are from, from the spiral, okay? And now we're going to fit one of these density estimation methods and we're going to simulate points from the fitted density and we're going to plot those, okay? Um, the, the left plot is kernel density estimation, you know, using your best choice of bandwidth, state-of-the-art choice of bandwidth. We, we fit the kernel density estimation to the, um, using Gaussian kernels. We didn't have a real, like, what other kernels are you going to use in multivariate cases? Could you use skewed kernels or something? They're not going to do that much better, I don't think. <coughs> and so it did very, pretty badly. Uh, the middle panel is Dirichlet process mixtures of bivariate Gaussian distributions, which did even worse. 
Long's going to be unhappy about that, but um, I was unhappy about it too. I was like, oh, we, at least we could beat kernel density estimation. But the, the reason kernel density estimation did better is that we're tying down the kernel at the data, and then we're just tuning the bandwidth. And so then it's sort of tied down. What's the Dirichlet process mix you're doing? Uh, we're doing Markov chain Monte Carlo. We're trying to figure out how many clusters we have, where are these clusters located. Maybe you start out Markov chain Monte Carlo and it doesn't know the spiral, and so it just throws down a Gaussian to cut some random locations. And then it, you know, the good mode that would actually fit the data would put like a Gaussian here, a Gaussian here, a Gaussian. It would put like 15 different Gaussians wrapped around this spiral. It can't find that mode running MCMC. It's just not going to find it. Um, and so I don't know how you could define, maybe you could come up with a clever algorithm for figuring it out, but I, I don't know how to do it. So it, it, it totally failed. Um, so that's motivating a lot of things like Long is doing and some other people on trying to come up with some more robust methods, but it didn't work. As is, unless we used our new kernel, if we used our new kernel, then we got this. Okay, here's another example uh, of that phenomenon. The KDE did a little better, still bad, but a little better than a Dirichlet process mixtures of bad kernels. Um, we did a lot better in this case. It's too easy for us because they're circles. But, um, you can do it also for drunk Olympic rings that are all distorted and it still does well. The sample size isn't small. We use current approaches for bandwidth selection. Um, et cetera, kind of state of the art, and, and the, the things did really bad, and these are really low dimensional problems, but with nonlinear structure. And so a, a big issue is that for multivariate Gaussian kernels, we need tons of uh, components in the mixture model to do well in something like this. It's just not going to do very well. Okay, so why is the Gaussian kernel so bad? Um, it's essentially a local linear approximation in this case, and so we we, a Gaussian is going to be like elliptical contours around a plane. And so if we have something that, that, that's like this, we need lots of planes. Um, and it's just not going to do very well uh, uh, for the reasons we showed in our covering theory. Um, so the local linear algorithms are going to require a lot of components. And so that was the motivation for spherelets. But what do we do in this model-based case? Well, we, we would like to use a different type of kernel. And there's a huge literature on different types of kernels. But I couldn't find anything that does the curvature thing. What do you usually do with different types of kernels? Well, there's like a, a skewed Gaussian that people like that allows skewness. There's, I could use a T kernel that would allow heavy tails. I could use a lot of things, but how am I going to use a kernel that bends around something? I mean, there's not, to my knowledge, uh, a density that actually has a simple analytic form. We could induce that through some complicated black box that had an unknown normalizing constant and various things. Um, but I'm, I mean like a simple kernel that I can write down analytically. And if I can't write it down analytically, I'm going to have big computational problems. Um, yeah. And if Long know, and, uh, knows about other kernels, that would be fantastic. But we couldn't find one. And so we, we tried to invent one. And the idea is quite simple. So what, what we basically do is we start with a sphere. We start with a sphere. We throw down a, a, a parametric density on a sphere known as a von Mises Fischer distribution, which is something like a Gaussian on a sphere. It has a, um, it has a location parameter and a scale parameter and puts um, uh, points exactly on a sphere. Okay, And so the sphere is then going to have some center and radius that's controlling the curvature and where it's located. And then, okay, and then now, after that, we don't want data points exactly in the sphere because our, our data always have measurement error. So we're going to add Gaussian noise at, um, to add, add Gaussian noise to that, that, that observation's Y, okay? And then we add a Gaussian measurement error. So we start out with these Ys that are exactly in the sphere. We add a Gaussian measurement error, and then we marginalize it out, and we get, we get a new class of multivariate distributions that have curvature, that have a simple closed analytic form, okay? And so now instead of just having a, a mean and a, a bandwidth parameter and a location parameter, there's also this center and radius parameter that are giving you more flexibility. Okay? And uh, we were initially worried about this modified Bessel function of the first kind of order nu, but that's tr very trivial to evaluate. And so this kernel is really useful, I think. I'd like to have a more flexible one, but this, uh, this one's quite nice, I think. So here's some examples. So now we can get densities for a single component or cluster in a mixture that look like that. 
look like that. Um, and we can mix them together. We can get funky things. We can get like a snake. <laughs> this is like D Dong's favorite, the Fisher Gaussian snake. Um, and we get all, all sorts of strange uh, densities mixing these things together. And they don't have to be thin things either. We, could, we can control the variance and make them fatter. Okay. So we implemented this in a Bayesian analysis, um, these, these kernels instead of Gaussian kernels. And it was important, we noticed it was important to, to be able to actually have the density closed form for mixing of the Markov chain Monte Carlo method. If we, if we wrote it indirectly through multiple layers, that would have been really a lot worse. Um, we used a two layer formulation to, to reuse the same, the same spheres, and so we didn't have to have too many spheres. But it was really quite a simple, uh, basically a Gibbs sampler. Um, we can show theory things that nobody cares about, like asymptotics. Um, yeah, it was a simple Gibbs sampler, as I said. Let's see how it works. Okay, so here's a, a little nastier example than the ones I showed earlier. This is a noisy torus. So the torus is an another example that should be bad for spherelets because as you move along the surface of a, uh, a torus, the curvature changes like wildly and it changes from negative to positive. And, and naively, a lot of people think, a lot of referees that read our paper not very carefully and then reject it because they haven't read the entire thing or something, um, think that the sphere can only deal with po positive curvature because the sphere has positive curvature. But you can put the sphere on like this side or this side <laughs> of the, the manifold and then it can deal with negative and positive curvature. And it can deal with cur varying curvature better than other things. And so it can deal with things like the torus. And so here's the original data, of noisy torus. Here's the kernel density estimation. Here's the really bad DPM of Gaussians. And here's uh, predictive samples from our, our Fisher-Gaussian mixture of, for the noisy torus. Um, and here's the noisy spiral. And so here, here we've inflated the noise a bit, um, but that's what we get. Okay, so we also tried, this is like a famous nasty example um, in, man, in manifold learning literature where I want to do classification like this. And so it should be really easy because they're really well separated. They're not like bleeding into each other with no separation. Um, but there's like a red class of cancer patients and then there's like the controls that are like the blue class. Can we like um, estimate that density and use it for classification? Um, and we did much better with the, the Dirichlet process mixture of Fisher Gaussians. And, and you can also, you can see that in the, uh, mis in the um, accuracy. And so in general, we, we would try to look at how the accuracy um, backing off the training sample size, starting to increase and see how the accuracy increases. And so KDE actually did surprisingly well if you gave it enough training samples. As you backed it off, for very few training samples, we had dramatically, super dramatically better um, accuracy um, using our, our thing than, than KDE. Use in like a discriminant analysis classifier, like model-based classifier. And we applied it to a bunch of other kind of, um, of these type of classification data sets. Um, there was a galaxy data set I found interesting where you have shape, um, um, they're classifying the shapes of galaxies, okay, from like astrophysics kind of example. Um, and so we hold out the labels and then we, we see what happens. Can we predict the label and the shape of the galaxy using, compared to other things, and we, we, we do much better. Um, and there's also this balanced scale data, gesture phase data, and we, um, we, we did a lot better in each of these cases um, in terms of classification performance in this kind of model-based clustering. So it, we also looked at, uh, in, in terms of density estimation, we uh, out of sample the sum of the log likelihood of the test data. And um, here's what we got, for example, for the balance scale data um, against training sample size. So we did, did really a lot better. I mean, like the, the, the log likelihood minus 620 versus like minus 575 or something. Um, yeah, so it, it seems quite useful. I'm quite, quite excited about this Fisher-Gaussian distribution. I think it might be quite, quite useful in kernel settings. Um, we would like to generalize it a lot farther, um, allow it to be more flexible. But if we lose that analytic form, then that, that becomes problematic. And so it's an interesting question. How, how, how can we make it more flexible without losing that simplicity? So in the, in the last part of the talk, I've got maybe 15 minutes before I should shut up. I'm going to talk about using spheres in, in two vignettes. Um, the one is for a more targeted, not model-based classification. 
and the one is for dis distance estimation, which I illustrate with clustering. Okay, so this is just a simple classifier. You could just think of machine, we want some machine learning algorithm, not model-based, to do classification. So we have some features XI, and we have some labels YI. Um, the features are, say, um, embedded in Euclidean space, and then the YIs are just some categorical label. Okay. So our classifier is just going to take uh, the features as input and spit out a class label. That's all the classifier is going to do. It's not a probability model or anything. Obviously, there's a huge literature, but we're interested in nasty problems. So like something like, like the, the, this thing over here. Okay, so, so I want to classify when the distributions have nonlinear support that's entangled with each other. So there's no way to like define some sort of separating hyperplane or something. Like in this case, you have nonlinear support, but I can just define some simple separ separ separating hyperplane. And so that's going to be a trivial problem. I can do anything and that'll do well. But what about this thing? I mean, this is going to be hard. A lot of stuff is going to uh, struggle with that. So if I can get something that works for that, maybe I could, it can work for other nasty um, problems where I'm trying to classify from imaging features or some such thing. Um, and so the thing we came up with, which is um, hopefully pretty much accepted at Biometrica, is what we call local manifold approximation. And so we're going to assume the points with label J are close to a manifold MJ. Okay, and then it doesn't have to be true globally. There doesn't have to be any manifold structure, but just locally within a neighborhood of any given point, you're using manifolds as an approximation. Okay, and so then we're going to assign x. So now we have some x. We want to class. We have a bunch of training data, and now we have a test data point x, which is a feature vector for a new point that we want to classify as being in one of these classes. So we're going to assign x to the class having the smallest distance. So we're going to, there's a manifold around, in a neighborhood around X, there's going to be an estimate of the manifold locally um, specific to each class. The class one, class two, class three, class four. We're going to calculate the distance to each of those and choose the class that has the minimal distance and that's, we're done. That's all the algorithm's doing. Okay. So it's like an embarrassingly simple. The manifolds are unknown and there's going to be measurement error, of course. Um, so we'll have put a hat on it, we'll estimate it. And so that just depends on local estimation of M. And so, so this kind of illustrates it. So here we have our funky, funky overlapping curves. We have this point here that we want to classify. We define a little neighborhood around that there. Okay, and then specific to this class, we define this manifold approximation because those are the points in that neighborhood. We just fit, say, a sphere to that. And then specific to this class, we define this approximation the other class, there's no points even in the neighborhood, and so we don't even include that class. Um, and then we, now we choose class M1 for that because it's closer than, than M2. That's our algorithm. Okay. Um, yeah, so we use the sphere. We could use other things locally. We could use local linear, but we use spheres because we're into spheres. Um, and, and so here, here shows some, some, some results. This is for the, that funky curves example. So we, we compared it to everything that we could find. So we took a suite of classifiers in MATLAB. There was 30 different classifiers. And I'm showing the best of our competitors. So we compared it to everything we could. Um, our, our thing we call SPA, or spherical approximation. Um, and so the best competitor was complex tree. We also had uh, deep neural networks in here. Um, um, often there was some version of SVMs. There's always like 15 versions of FVMs, some kernelized FVM or something. And that, that, that did pretty well. There was a k-nearest neighbor. And in general, we will back up the training sample size and try to increase that and see what happens in classification performance. And so here, actually, the best of the competitors to find KNN was pretty darn close to us. So we didn't do that much better. It could actually pick up in this example. But that was the best of the 30 different things we looked at. Um, we have an asymptotic accuracy bound. I don't want to go over that, but we have some theory um, showing that our thing does some nice stuff. Um, we also looked at some imaging data. So, um, so for image data, P is going to be pretty large, so N might be enormous for good performance for a lot of classifiers. Like there has been this, for image data particularly, I think that deep neural networks have been really, really popular, in particular convolutional neural networks. But most of the examples they have are just huge training sample sizes, like just really enormous. And so we'd like to have something that works well for much smaller training sample sizes. 
Um, and SPA seems to in the couple of cases we've looked at. And so here's a very famous example, this U UPS handwritten digits, um, partly showing that convolutional neural networks and stuff can do well. Um, but we're, now we back up the training sample size and it'll be even, there'll be a bigger gap if we go lower than 1,000 to 500 or 250, then we'll be, have a bit much bigger gap with the competitors. And convolutional neural network nets is, uh, is this, this dashed line right here. And eventually it's gonna catch up with us. Um, might even beat us by a little bit. We haven't checked that uh, for larger training sample sizes. But initially, we, we do better for smaller training sample sizes. And, and our algorithm is like ridiculously simple. We're not like doing some sort of non-convex optimization and running stochastic gradient descent and, and tuning our convolutional neural net and figuring out the number of layers and doing all this stuff. We're just like doing this ridiculously simple thing. Um, you know, just vectorizing these images and then looking at those local manifold approximation, which could fit in two seconds analytically, less, way less than two seconds. And yeah, so the computational time, it's, we were pretty excited about it. We haven't tried it a lot for more complicated imaging problems, but it would be interesting to try. Um, yeah, so the last vignette, so that was classification using this kind of sphere idea. Um, often it's useful to calculate distances and, and use distances as an input because many, many machine learning or statistical approaches um, take as an input into the procedure a pairwise distance matrix. Okay, so if I can calculate distances between pairs of data points, then I can do an ana analysis based on that pairwise distance matrix. And so the question is, well, what kind of distance do you feed in? Okay. Um, Oh, um, yeah, so that gets at this. So, so if, you, if you have something like this, if your data are like this, and I, I just used Euclidean distance, then if I had a point here and a point here, then Euclidean distance would be pretty short. But in reality, maybe the, the re appropriate geometric distance might be like, well, I have to go all the way around here, okay? And that would be the geodesic distance. But then if I just have these data, how do I calculate the geodesic distance? just based on the data, I could calculate the geodesic distance and then I maybe have pairwise geodesic distances, I can feed that into any machine learning algorithm, statistical algorithm. Okay, so the geodesic distance is the length of the shortest path on the manifold connecting X and Y. And um, it's only computable for very simple known manifolds. And so we wanted to have some toy examples. There's almost no examples where you can just calculate the geodesic distance. Even for an ellipse, it's not tractable. A sphere you can, and a plane you can. Um, current algorithms, what they do, like I would say state-of-the-art algorithms, they combine kind of local within neighborhood and global estimation. So within a neighborhood, they use, um, they use Euclidean distance, which will be like a local linear approximation. And then they're going to connect those local linear approximations through like a graph path algorithm. And that's how they calculate geodesic distance. And so what we're going to do is just take their algorithm, um, iso, the isomap algorithm, and replace uh, locally Euclidean with locally spherical and see if we can improve things. Okay. So the spherical distance, you can calculate the distance, say if I have two points x and y on a surface of sphere s, then this, this is the equation for the geodesic distance between those points. It's just trivial. Well, I don't know how useful that is. but. <laughs> Okay, so now we have noise. And so in practice, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have x hat, y hat. That's gonna be the projection of x and y um, to the best sphere um, in that local region. Um, okay, and then we're gonna estimate the point between x and y, but we're gonna project it to the best sphere and then we're gonna take the geodesic distance. Okay, so it's gonna be robust to measurement error noise. The other, the current state-of-the-art algorithms um, are very not robust to measurement error noise, which measurement error is really important. In practice, we always have measurement error in these types of examples. Okay, and we can prove, um, we can prove that we have a higher order of accuracy than, than for Euclidean distance, okay? Local Euclidean distance. And you can see that in cases like in the Euler spiral where we can actually calculate things. If we look at as the, um, as the distance between the points increases and how much the error blows up, um, our, our, our curve is the blue one here. And so we're like right, not blowing up at all, really. And then the, um, 
The red curve is a recent um, uh, method developed by Hao Cheng Wu at Duke, um, this covariance adjusted method, which is, it has our same rate of theoretical performance. Um, and the, uh, the, the black line is the, is the current um, kind of local Euclidean method. The covariance method fails when you add any, any amount of measurement error. It becomes worse than the local Euclidean method. It's very non-robust to measurement error. Okay. Um, so it, it does a lot better, the spherical, in that case. We wanted to try it in, a, in, a, in, a, in an application where we're second order because you're, you're not usually in statistical machine learning applications, you're not using the geodesic distance directly. It's not of interest directly. You want to use it within some algorithm. And so many algorithms use those. Um, so one example is k-medioids. So we're going to try to do clustering based on k-medioids, an alternative to k-means. And so we minimize distances between points in each group and the group centers, and we're trying to figure out the groups. <coughs> um, the input is a pairwise distance matrix between data points, okay? And so we could just choose what most people do is just the Euclidean distance between the data points and just stick that in. Or we could use what you call the graph Euclidean distance, which would be based on isomap using um, um, gra graph distance overall, but Euclidean locally within neighborhoods. So that's K E medioids. Or we could use our graph spherical, which is our method, which is KS medioids. Okay. Um, and so we tried it for this um, common example um, where you have these kind of nested ellipses. And we, we did, did a lot did quite well in that case. I wasn't that interested in it because it's a silly toy example. But we also tried for some real data examples. And so here's some banknote forgery data um, that we were looking at. And we looked at. Uh, held, we, we hold out a cl class label, and we look at six measurements of the clustering performance, um, adjusted RAND index, et cetera, et cetera. The larger, the better for each of these. Um, and we got this massive improvement, okay, which is pretty amazing, actually. Um, so the, uh, in this case, the regular K-medioids did better than the K-E-medioids, which had terrible performance. The larger is better in terms of these indexes. And we had like just massively better performance in clustering in this case, for this real banknote data. Uh, we also looked at this galaxy data, this classifying galaxies based on the shape of the galaxy. Um, and um, so we have spiral galaxies, elliptical galaxies. And we looked at, again, clustering performance. And we, we again, got a very massively better, better performance than, than using these, uh, just changing the distance metric to be better. I mean, it really did make a big difference um, using the local, um, local spherical to get the geodesic distance. So you got a much ac more accurate geodesic distance. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop there. Everyone's bored with me. But um, the overarching theme was using spheres for local approximation instead of planes. Um, then we can change PCA to SPCA. We can change Gaussian kernels to a Fisher Gaussian kernel. We can use spherical distance instead of Euclidean distance. And, and there's a lot of applications, many of which I didn't talk about today. Um, manifold learning, denoising, data visualization is one I didn't talk about, um, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. So interesting future areas. It would be interesting to generalize spherelets, maybe to ellipses or quadratic surfaces without um, sacrificing some of the computational gains. Uh, it would be nice to scale up to large P and N cases. Um, there's a trivial way we can do that which I'm not entirely happy with, but we can t we're using SPCA to embed the sphere in a D plus one dimensional space. At that point, we could just use SPCA. I'm not convinced that that really captures a geometric structure, um, but we're working on that with a couple of, uh, of Indian students, uh, visiting students from last summer. And um, we'd like to also be able to deal with data that aren't, aren't in RP. Uh, that, that should be relatively easy if, if we don't take a model-based approach. And uh, this is based on, on these four papers up, um, up on archive. It's all work in Didong Lee's uh, um, PhD thesis. And he's um, on the faculty job market and certainly one of the best students I've ever worked with. He's fantastic. And that's him right here. And Minerva has also contributed greatly to this project. So, and I'll stop there. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Dunson? <coughs> um, 
So, Mr. Smith, I'm just wondering about the, um, the situation where the curvature is changing the sign a lot, because you say the CISRO is actually a very good example for your method, because curvature doesn't change the sign. You just take care of the right, you know, sub, subspace. Um, but when I the mean, the Swiss roll is like almost a counterexample because the curvature varies a lot. The, uh, yeah, as, you as you look at different directions, the, cha the principal curvature changes a lot because if you go this way, the Swiss roll is going like this, the curvature is zero this way. Yeah, but if you take care of that issue, then it's still very good because I was just wondering, wondering about the situation where the curvature keeps changing sign. It's like the fungi curves, but it, it, you know, you know, but it happened more frequently and and clearly compared to PCA, you know, in terms of approximation, this has been better, but I'm yeah. wondering about, you know, computational cost because you, you, you might, you know, you might incur a lot of extra uh, computational costs by um, going If it's changing a lot, you, you would get more computational costs because you would need to have more spheres. Is yeah. that your point? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's, um, that's true and inherently, and that, that's why we would like better dictionaries. Um, it's certainly going to do a lot better than PCA, in that case, because PCA is going to be even more local planes, even with a lot of changing curvature. PCA doesn't do well in that case either, and so you need lots of little planes. Um, and so the, you could think the Swiss rule is one example of that. We could kind of put, it would kind of put three spheres next to each other, and kind of, and then put another one, another one as you go through. Um, you might end up having a lot of spheres if there's a lot of changes, if it's like a very erratic manifold. I think that's true, and then you know, one solution direction towards a solution to that is can we have a richer dictionary that maintains some sort of computational tractability? We're really interested in that. It's not clear how to do it exactly, because this is much harder than if you have like a, a, a regression problem, like I have f of x, y equals f of x plus epsilon, and the x's are known. Then there's like a huge literature on different basis expansions and stuff for f, but here it's just like unsupervised. We just have x's. There's no input. We just have x's, and we want some sort of basis for where the support tends to be concentrated up to some measurement error. Um, and so there's, there's really not much work on that. I mean, we can try to get at that indirectly through some nasty nonlinear factor model, but then that becomes um, quite intractable. Yeah. Right, so I guess the related question is, may follow up on that is, uh, is there a way to test if this is appropriate you know, for, you know, for a given data set? Because it's high, highly de high dimensional and uh... yeah, I mean you can do cross validation. I mean that's that's one game. It depends on what your focus is. I mean mostly with cross validation, it wouldn't be a, a, an absolute test. We could test also whether how well it fits, like with the the, the sum of the log likelihoods out of sample. But then we have to have a competitor, and so then we're comparing with the competitor. Are we doing well enough? Is there some absolute goodness of fit test? Um, we don't have something like that, but I, I assume that you could come up with some diagnostic. We haven't thought about it at all. But. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I just have detailed question about the distance estimation. When you say that you have two points at the x and the y, you project the point to the best spherulets. It, is my understanding correct? So you only project to one best spherulet. Yeah, you guys should have chalk, but um, <laughs> if, you're, um, if you're like this or something, and now I want to get the point between that and that, I want to get the, or that and that, say. I want to get the, the distance between that and that, I would, oh, you do have chalk. Yeah. <laughs> You've hidden it from me, okay. Uh, um, it's like a, a big, it's almost like a philosophical question, like how do I calculate a geodesic distance when there's measurement error? It's kind of almost unaddressed in the literature, but. The way we did it is we would like project that to there and that to, th that, that to there, and then we would calculate the distance between these points was this distance. Yeah, so yeah. my question is more like when the curvature is very curved, like the po two points are, are distance like this way, then... Yeah, I mean, you might run into some problems if you're like... I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, you're, if it's like folding back on it itself, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, then, then you can potentially run into problems because the, um, you know, usually what people do is that um, theoretically in this literature is that they assume the measurement error is bounded and then like it has some bound relative to the injectivity radius and so that you don't have that, you don't have it like bleeding between the gaps. But I think in practice what we're just going to have is 
you know, we're not going to get a super high accuracy at some resolution in there if it's kind of folding back on itself so much that it's just, it's hard to disambiguate. You can't just intrinsically can't disambiguate the measurement error from where you are in the manifold. That's just a, it's kind of an, an intrinsic unsolvable problem in this class of problems. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for a brilliant talk. Uh, I just didn't quite follow on the single page that introduces the methodology of spherical PC. Can you just spend a more minute on that? Think, thanks. Yeah, ask questions while I'm, I'm scrolling. <laughs> Yeah. How do you know you have no structure? So this is a very powerful tool when you do have a manifold structure. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that's a so great question. Yeah, the yeah. The other direction that, is That's like a fantastic. I love that question. Yeah. So, um, so what if it's just all noise or something like that? I mean, I mean one, one, one way you can tell is um, the, the kind of poor man's way to do it and the machine learning way to do it. And, I, I, and we could think of more complicated model-based ways. but would be I have a holdout sample and, I, I, and I'm comparing my structured model to a simpler model, like just fitting a Gaussian <laughs> something. And the mixture of Gaussians will pick that up, of course, if it's just one Gaussian, because it's just noise. It's like, well, that'll, if you can figure that out because it's learning the covariance and stuff and the, and the mixture of Gaussians are one Gaussian. And so then I won't see any gain in terms of my log likelihood out of sample. Um, by using one of these methods that is picking up on the uh, kind of lo lo lower dimensional structure. Um, and so th that, that's one, one way to look at things, is cross-validation should pick up on it. Yeah. But uh, in comparison to other methods. Um, I mean, if, but if there, is, is there something like, oh, can I test whether there is actually a, manifold, a true manifold structure? I mean, I don't know that if that's so easy, and I also think that the method is much broader than having an exact manifold structure. It can allow gaps and other things, and so um, it can allow quite a variety of um, structures, including just ev everything could just be flat because then the radius gets blown up, um, and so that, that, that would just allow flat, um, and then, then it could blow up the noise, and so it can kind of pick up the, the case as a special case um, that is just like just a cloud of noise. Yeah, it should be able to pick that up, but then it won't gain at all relative to something simpler, and then you can compare with cross-validation, for example. You, you would get something in the Fisher Gaussian kernel, right? So what would that, I just have hard time I mean, time for to the Fisher Gaussian it. kernel, it, it can certainly fit things if it's not, if it's not actually some nonlinear thing. Um, right. it, it'll fit would fine. Would they actually get back to Gaussian, though? Sure, yeah, 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 because it, 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 it is updating the radius. And so right. if the radius is, is large, so you, you don't, as the radius you becomes don't large, anything, it becomes basically. flat. And right. so it, it, it pretty rapidly becomes, so it's like very close, uh, very close, I mean, you could see very close to like uh, something like that. So you would still get a, a basis. It's just yeah, basis. yeah, and if you, don't, if you don't quite trust that, it's really easy to just mix together Fisher Gaussians and regular right. Gaussians. And then like, oh, you could, if you did a Bayesian way, you put a weight on each of them and it can adaptively kill off the Fisher Gaussians if it doesn't like them. I mean, you could also do that in a frequentist way. Um, so that would be another model-based way to do it, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, Sorry. There's the, yeah. So yeah, the, the question is, um, so basically you're doing, first of all, uh, low-dimensional convection. Yeah. So we started PCA out does. with some sort of a mean square loss function, yeah. and that became an intractable. And so we, we, then we defined this other kind of um, loss function that was just as reasonable. And then from solving that, we could then solve for the center of, of the sphere from that loss function, and then plugging in the center, then we can solve for the radius. And that's how we got this. So there's a... Um, there, there's a valid loss function that I we're see. optimizing to solve, this, to solve this. It's not like this ad hoc projection to a sphere, uh, to a, uh, a d plus one dimensional space followed by, it, it's actually solving a, 
loss function. I can but, show you the details from the But program. it looks really simple. I mean, this procedure, basically, it's like. It's very simple. PC, yeah. and then you do the spherical transformation. Yeah, and we spent a while, like we spent maybe even months, like because we, we were playing with the wrong loss function. Got it. Or a loss <laughs> function that led to non-convex optimization, blah, blah, blah. And then you start iterating, and you don't, it's like unstable. And, and so we had to just change the loss function, and it becomes much more robust. And it also gives us this simple simple analytic solution. And so it's very robust, I should say, as well, relative to other ways you could do this. Thank you very much. And that's known by the form of the loss function. It's inherited from that. Yeah, yeah let's save the other. Well, one last. So my, <laughs> so my data is, say, like a few hundred patients, and I've measured about 100 proteins on them, and they're all correlated, and I got gender, and I got race, and I got some categorical variables. and. Do you really believe, and not, that data is not I mean, going to look like a um, Swiss roll. It's just not going to look like a galaxy or a Swiss roll. Or, no, definitely not. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. What, what, is this useful? What, what do I, what do I, I get I mean, here? I hope so. I mean, this is like the first step. I mean, like literally, we haven't published any of these papers. They're up on archive. And I, I'm like interested in those examples more than galaxies and stuff too. And so we would like to then try it out for these more realistic examples. I don't know. This is also realistic maybe, but um, for those types of examples and we're, I don't know that you can directly use it for that now. I mean, you probably can, um, but we haven't we haven't properly tried it out and seen how much it really helps for like bi biomedical examples. We're collecting a whole variety of different weird variables, genomic variables, or other variables on patients. I just we just haven't tried it yet. So. so what would I get? What would it give me in that example? I mean, what you're not actually producing them. The manifolds, right? You're just sort of having a metric which says I'm yeah, describing I mean, you, you, the state you, you of are, You are doing dimension reduction. And so you, you can get, um, in that example, you, you can get lower dimensional features. Um, and so that might help a lot. Like people do PCA or factor analysis of sparse PCA or something a lot in those types of examples. And so this would give you a, a nonlinear version of that. And you could do it in an unsupervised way. And uh, for data visualization, you could do it in a supervised way. Um, just adding another component to the, to the loss function or the likelihood, and then you might get a lot better predictive performance, and hopefully you would get some interpretability, and we're working on that a lot, um, the interpretation. That's not in the current papers, but you can get, uh, what I want is to say, oh, this component loads on these variables. Like I get, like I like sparse PCA a lot for that reason, um, or sparse factor modeling, and, and we're, we, we, we can get something like that with this, we haven't written it up yet, so. Um, it's much more challenging um, if it, everything's not flat. One last question. Hi, uh, I'm wondering if a combination of linear and spherical uh, basis could give better uh, results in some cases? Yeah, definitely we could do that. That, that would be basically like combining Gaussian kernels with Fisher Gaussian kernels. You can also just ca combine linear and um, and just regular PCA and spherical PCA, and even do it like adaptively. Oh, I'm in this local region. I'm going to do both, and then like choose one that fits better. Maybe penalize for the two additional parameters. You can you can do that trivially. Yeah, and that that might work better. Yeah, particularly if it's really close to flat, like that Shane was worried about. Um, you know, like I don't know if I want to make the center super far away, make the radius like 10,000. <laughs> I mean, it might be better just to like allow it to choose between the two two choices. Yeah, we've tried that out already, actually. Thank you. All right, great. Let's thank Dr. Danson for the inspiring talk again. Thank you.